This is a Veterans History Project oral history interview with Mr. Charles H. Millen of the Royal Air Force. Mr. Millen, would you tell us where you were born and when you were born? I was born on September the 15th, 1923, <coughs> in London, England. Where were you raised? My early years were spent in London, mm -hmm. and then because of my, my father had chronic leukemia, we had to move to the West Country, where he, he was a priest and he was given a smaller parish. And um, did you go to school in the West part of England? I went to school, first school was in Yeovil, Somerset a little day school and I went there for a few years and then I went to boarding school when I was about nine years old. When did you graduate from boarding school? I went to Wells Cathedral Choir School when I was nine years old. But I, I didn't sing in the choir, I've got a lousy singing voice. Um, I stayed there for two years and I got a scholarship to a public school, what is known as a public school in England. It was St. John's Leatherhead. And I was there until I was 16 when I graduated with my Oxford and Cambridge matriculation. Mm -hmm. In Cambridge, is that where you... No. Is that where the St. John's, was that the school, the public school you went to, sir? Yeah, the public school I went to was in Leatherhead. In Leatherhead. Yeah. And then you graduated from there when you were how old? Sixteen. Sixteen. So that would have been about 1939? About right. Not 1939. And um, what did you do after you graduated again, in 1939, after school? Um, I worked for the Equity and Law Life Assurance Society. Okay, you work for a life insurance, life assurance society, and that would have been 1939? Had war broken out yet in 1939? War broke out in September 39. What do you recall about that time? Um, We, we had uh, there was a, a, an opinion abroad in England that there would be war against the Germans and uh, my father was in the war in uh, World War One. He was a chaplain, and um, so I, I naturally speculated as to if there was a war, what would I do? Would I join up, join the military, and so on? And um, I uh, had been brought up to believe that one always volunteered for service in the armed forces of one's country. So I, I wasn't going to wait to be conscripted. Okay. So were you about 16 years old in 1939? Um, let's see, I would have been a little over six, yes. Just to turn 16. Yeah. And what did you decide to do when the Battle of Britain began? Or when war broke out in 1939? Well, I volunteered for the Home Guard. Tell, how did you, how did you go about volunteering? I went down to the local house where they were headquartered. Where was that local house? In Edgeware. In London? In London. In London. And what, what time of year was it that you went down to that local house to volunteer? 
It would have been after the war had started. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact date. <clears throat> what happened when you went and volunteered? Well, they took me right away. When they took you right away, did they take you that day? Yep. Where did you go? I stayed living in Edgware and, uh, with my mo widowed mother and two sisters. What was your responsibility when you went and volunteered? What did you decide to do when you well, went? I had a motorcycle. Tell me, before you talk about the motorcycle, you're 16 years old when you go and volunteer. Was there, did you know what you wanted to do when you volunteered? Uh, I wanted to be a dispatch rider. A dispatch rider. Let me ask you more, a, 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 a more specific question. Was there an age problem because you were 16? No. Okay. Did you want to be in the armed services? Uh, not being in, uh, from Britain, I don't know how the responsibilities went in 1939, but um, would you have been in, uh, are, are you officially as a part of the army? Are you officially a part of, what are you a part of at that time? You're, you're, it's, it's like a civilian army. Okay. Um, a regular army had returned from France and um, they, they were cut off by the Germans and they were evacuated in a hurry. And they didn't have any arms or munitions or anything. Okay. So we, we uh, we were a hastily put together uh, group of civilians. It was organized by Winston Churchill. And um, our job was going to be to defend England as best we could. Okay. Now, was that what everybody was in the process of doing at that point? in 1939 when when people went to the so when you went down to join the home the home guard. guard at age 16 in September 1939 and you stayed you you also so you stayed at home in Edgware volunteering to serve uh, were there others that went and joined the same day with you I'm sure there were I don't know who they were you didn't, they weren't friends, you just, you went on your own. Went on my own. You went on your own, and they immediately accepted you to be in. Were you to be paid a salary while you were doing this? No. no okay. No compensation. No compensation. Now you're in there, and what is your day-to-day -day responsibility? You're still living at home. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I would, uh, I don't remember how many hours I had to put in a week, but I, I would be on duty at night. What would you do at night? Go down to the headquarters house there and um, await orders to deliver or receive messages by my motorcycle. We had no radio or television in those days, so you couldn't pick up a, an instrument and receive or give orders. What were the orders and the messages that you were delivering? Who were they for? A local headquarters. They would, could be to the fire department mm -hmm. or the police. What kind of messages were they? Do you remember? Wasn't allowed to see them. Who would you get the message uh, orders from? Who would give them to you? The duty officer in our local headquarters. And was the duty officer also part of the Home Guard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things was the, was the Home Guard doing at that time? Well, We, we were a hastily put together group of men. There were, a lot of them were old World War I uh, veterans. 
and there were young kids like myself. And uh, we had no arms, no ammunition, nothing. Uh, and then, then one day we received a crate of arms from the United States. A group of hunt, huntsmen in this country sent us over their rifles. Were you issued a rifle? Do you remember the kind of rifle it was? It seems to me it was a Browning. Did you have a chance to practice using it? Yeah. Where did they have you practice using it? We had, we had a, a local uh, rifle range where we could use it. I, I was an experienced f shot. I'd served in the officer's training corps, boarding school. And I, I had uh, spent a camp at Bisley, B-I-S-L-E-Y, which was a famous shooting camp. And that was when you were in school. You had you had learned to do that. Were you part of the like the ROTC here? Did you did, were you a uh, like an officer, an undergraduate training program, a military training program in in your undergraduate years then? Yeah. So you had been familiar with military protocol and procedure. Oh yeah, I knew all the drugs. Oh, that's great. Okay. <coughs> so um, you received the crate of arms, and there, and you had practicing, and you were able to do that. And and at night, much of your responsibility, remember, was was to deliver messages in the evening. Correct. And you had a motorcycle. Yeah. What was that like? It was a Royal Enfield single cylinder. Yeah. How far would you go on that motorcycle to deliver a message? I don't know. Twenty miles, within twenty miles. Did you have a sector, or you were just deciding to go? They would tell you where to take it to. Yeah. You were taking. Me. How long did you do that? I think I probably did it for about a year. For about a year. You had described earlier about the battle, the Battle of Britain, and uh, some of the bombing that all the bombing. I guess it was this yeah. during the time of the Battle of Britain. We. We were bombed in Edgware along with the rest of London. Now, do you recall when the bombing started? Um, the first air raid siren went off five minutes after Neville Chamberlain gave his speech announcing that England was at war with Germany. And uh, I remember seeing the congregation of a local church all running past our apartment building. We lived in an apartment and uh, they were all going home because the air raid warning was sounding. But it was a false alarm. So there weren't any more false alarms after that, all real alarms. And the actual bombing didn't start until 1940. Uh, 1940? Yeah, it had been the summer of 1940. Tell me about some of the some of the attacks that happened while you were working on the Home Guard. Any of the air raid attacks that the Germans had? The, the, um, gosh, I, I Go ahead, Mr. Miller. It, it must have been a Stuka. Would that have been 1940? That would have been in 1940. Now, before we get to the Stuka attack, you have gone into the Home Guard in 1939, so you're in there for about a year now. So now it's into 1940. And now that the, the battle, the, they're beginning, they're bombing London. And we were describing a Stuka attack. Could you, could you re recall that for us? Yeah, I, it, it was one afternoon. I was alone at home in the apartment. And there was this incredible screaming noise. These Stukas had 
special sirens on them, and the purpose of them was to frighten the hell out of the civilian population. And the noise was so great, it just uh, crudely blew the wax out of your ears. And uh, I remember the only time I've ever done this, I fell flat on the floor. And I was shaking like a leaf. And then the bombs landed and exploded. How about fire raids? Were there fire raids? Tell me about those. Um, the Germans would um, didn't follow any particular pattern. They just came over and dropped high explosive bombs. And they would aim to mingle those with incendiary bombs. And an incendiary bomb was about uh, 15 inches long and about uh, 4 inches diameter. And, and they um, had a very high temperature. They would land on a building and immediately set it on fire. I had to do um, practice putting out incendiary bombs. The way you did it, we had a bucket of water and a stirrup pump. This is like pumping water through a garden hose. When you had a nozzle on the hose, you could get a, a fine spray or you could get a jet of water. Now, you didn't use a jet of water on an incendiary bomb because the water would make it explode and you'd be badly burned. So you used a fine spray and um, that would cause the incendiary bomb to burn even more fiercely and burn itself out very quickly. Yep. Continue on. Um, I used to um, do fire watching on our office building in the heart of London of the 20 Lincoln's in the field. And um, you stand on the roof and if any incendiaries landed on the roof, it was your job to get rid of them, put them out. Uh, you could do that with a bucket of sand or pour sand over them, that would cause them to extinguish, or you could use the water. What else do you remember happening during that time period? I remember, uh, I've said something about that, it's a Stuka dive bomber coming down. Stupid. Land, landed bombs down the edge of a road mm -hmm. and uh, caused quite a bit of damage. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember another night a uh, bomb landed uh, on the street in front of the pub or public house, which is a, a, a you know what a pub is. Yes, sir. <laughs> and there's a hideous yelling. It had blown a, a guy's arm off. And um, we used to get a lot of action around where we lived because the, there's a big poli uh, police headquarters there. And 
police cars, you could hear them coming and going all night long. In the early days of the war, they rounded up all the aliens in the country. What were you doing when you weren't uh, serving as a, uh, a messenger with the Home Guard? Were you, were you doing anything else during your day? I, I was working for the Equity and Law Life Assurance Society in the accounting department. Okay. So I'd drive there on the motorcycle every morning and then drive back home in the afternoon, the end of the work day. Good. But we're still talking about your time as a 16 to 17 year old during the Battle of Britain and you're working in the Home Guard. And we're talking now about home life for you in your house and preparing for air raids and the various things. Could you tell us a little bit about what happened? Well, I, I, was, I was away working a normal work day. Mm -hmm. You had a bomb shelter in the backyard? And we had a bomb shelter in the kitchen. My mother ran a bake shop in this shell, steel shelter. There were two kinds of shelters government handed out. One was the Anderson shelter, which uh, you installed partially below ground if you had a garden. We, we didn't. So we were given an, a Morrison shelter, and it, it was a table like, like this, but bigger. And um, it was it was pretty strong, and um, it was solid steel top. Mother used to use it to, for rolling out her baked goods on in the kitchen behind the store. So we would all crawl under that at night. It was a heavy local air raid. The house could collapse on that shelter and it would protect you. Really strong. Yeah. Really strong. Um, is there anything else that you can recall about that time period? Uh, um, how frequent were the air raids? Do you remember again? How frequently did they occur? They're, they're pretty much every night. Hmm. Was, uh, I remember it was pretty hard to um, get sleep at night and go to work in the daytime. What made you want to volunteer for the Royal Air Force? Well, um, th there was a lot of publicity about the Royal Air Force in those days. They'd won the Battle of Britain, and as a result, Hitler um, cancelled his plans to invade England. Um, and then one day I was in the backyard behind our apartment building and um, there was an air raid on and I heard the planes overhead very low and a German plane went by and an RAF plane came along and was firing at it. <laughs> it was pretty exciting. Right, over, right over your apartment, huh? Did, right. did, did he get him? don't know. They both disappeared into the clouds after that. For the sake of our history, you could say you got them, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would, would make me happy. All right. That's very, that's very exciting to hear that. Um, and, and so that was something that seemed to inspire you a little bit, right? Uh, you saw that and, and thought that was kind of... I thought, I thought, you know, that's what the hell I'm going to do. I'm going to join the Air Force. Well, you, when you walked down, you said you went down, did you, did you walk, did you drive to the, to the area, to the recruiting this center? Recruiting, I, I think I walked down there. Was that in Edgeware as well? Uh, yeah, it was about a quarter of a mile from the house. Did you tell your mom that that's what you were going to do? No, I didn't tell my sisters or my mother. I just went down, I didn't tell my employer either. <laughs> I just did it. Uh, and, and what happened when you went went down to do that? What did they say to you? Well, they were very glad to see me because I was a volunteer, mm -hmm. and 
and the recruiting officer was delighted to see me. And I, I told him I wanted to fly. And he said, well, I, I can't guarantee you'll fly, but there's a good chance you will, you're the right age and so on. What happened after you went down that that day to to volunteer for the R R A F? They did they accept you that day? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I had to fill in a lot of forms and so on, and then I had to wait, and I was don't know how long it took, but I I received a letter and I had to I think I went to Oxford University. I went there by train and was given a whole battery of tests. That was some time later that you went to Oxford University for the testing to be in the RAF. Yeah. Tell me about the day you went home though after you volunteered for the RAF and telling your family. What was that like? I just told them I volunteered for the RAF. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I don't think they were surprised. Um, mm -hmm. They were delighted that I had volunteered. Mm -hmm. Not waited to be conscripted. It was d my for my generation. I'm going to boarding school and been the officers' training corps. It was a disgrace to be conscripted. Okay, I understand that. So you had that background that 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 sort of led you to wanting to do that to to make sure. Uh, yep, I uh, I had an intense dislike for the Germans. Um, I remember somewhere around 1938, we, we used to get the daily newspapers at our boarding school and they'd mount them on a newspaper stand and you could go into the library and re read, read the headlines. And I always remember reading the headlines where the Germans had taken over this particular part of Europe. and. Um, they were mistreating, I think, I think they were the Jew, Jews. And what they liked to do was get a man and shove a hose pipe up his rear end and then turn the water on full blast and wait until the dirty water spilled out over his mouth and the fellow screamed and hollered. And, is a pretty horrible way to treat a human being. And the Germans thought it was great fun. So I, I thought, hell, those people are no good, we've got to get rid of them. And um, so I had no out in my mind about the need to join up to fight the Germans and beat them. You said you took a train to Oxford sometime, some weeks after you volunteered. Yeah. Did you go by yourself in the train? Yeah. And when you got to Oxford, did someone meet you at the train station? Did you? I don't remember all those okay. details, but I, I, I remember going to this building, I think it was part of the university. And uh, I was given instructions where to report into a certain room, and I went through a series of, of operations. Mm -hmm. They they gave me a very thorough physical exam. They they even had a device for testing your. Uh, Ability to uh, what it would differentiate in your sightseeing. Mm -hmm. They they had figures <coughs> they can control with the depth ball. Uh, yeah, the depth perception thing. Mm -hmm. Depth perception. Mm -hmm. That was it. Now, where did you go after Oxford? Where did you stay when you were at Oxford for this testing? In the Dorms and the. I think we were put mm -hmm. up in a dorm. Yeah, I was there for about two days. What happened after the testing period was over? Where'd you go? I was sent home. What happened next? Waited. How long did you wait? Uh, 
let's see, I, I got my papers to report to the RAF in 19, what was it, 1940. Okay. So this is now 1940. It was about January 1940, I think. Okay. Where were you instructed to go to? Where Where were your papers ordering you to go to? St. John's Wood, a suburb of London, and I had to report to a, uh, a block of flats, a bit, huge block of flats mm -hmm. in St. John's Wood. What was What was there? Well. I, uh, the thing I remember most was, uh, that was where I first got all my inoculations. And um, a whole lot of us stood in a long line and uh, went past these medics. Mm -hmm. The first one stuck a hypodermic needle in my left breast mm -hmm. and squeezed it and then unscrewed the hypodermic and left the needle dangling from my breast and I went on to the next man. He took another hypodermic and screwed it into the needle and squirted in another um, bunch of stuff. It was a pretty crude way of doing it but he did it and uh, I was I took this pretty well, because I remember the man standing in front of me in line, big, tall, six-foot guy, he'd been a London policeman, and the guy fainted and <laughs> fell to the floor and cracked his skull and had to haul him off to a hospital. And I thought, well, if I could take it all right, I'm pretty good. So uh, after that, they issued us uh, our uniforms. Um, we, we had battle, battle dress boots and all the usual stuff. And they gave us a kit bag to put it in. Now, because I was volunteering for air crew, that wasn't good enough. I had to have a, another kit bag. And that was filled with two flying suits and uh, a, a flying helmet and uh, oxygen mask and various things. And here we had to lug all this bloody stuff around with incredible pain in the left arm from the shots and no mercy was shown. <laughs> After you had all that, the, the shots and the uniforms, where, where were you sent to? Where did that well, go? Uh, give you an idea of the type of discipline. I remember one of the first meals we had, the orderly officers came around and asked if there were any complaints. And some guy stuck his hand up in the air and they asked him, what, what's your complaint? And he said, the Dishes and um, you said the dishes were not clean. Yeah, and the knives and forks weren't. And so the old officer said, "Do you think you could do a better job?" And the damn fool said, "Yes, sir." He said, "Okay, you report to so and so tonight, and you do the dishes." <laughs> So I learned from that, never, never complain about anything. When you, uh, and is this all at the St. John's Ward area in London? Is this where this is still at? Yes, St. John's Ward, yeah. I was probably there for about two weeks. Two weeks, and did, where did you stay during those two weeks? In, in, in one of the apartments. In the apartments. Yeah. Um, after that two week time period, this is, Early 1940, where did you go? Then I was sent by train up to um, Scarborough in Yorkshire. Scarborough in Yorkshire? S-C-A-R-B-O-R-O-U-G-H, -S Scarborough. <clears throat> Who did you take the train with? I don't know, the 
just a group of us. All, all of you who are who were wanting to be pilots yeah. in the area? Yeah. What, what is Scarborough? It was a seaside resort in peacetime mm -hmm. on the North Sea. What was it used for at, uh, during the war? I don't know. We, we had a bunch of hotels there and uh, it was cold as hell. We used to do drill there. We'd be marched up and down the seafront. And uh, uh -huh. what what were your days like uh, at Scar? How, first of all, how long we, did you spend at Scarborough? Do you remember? Two, two, two or three weeks, I think. Would you describe that as your basic training? Yeah. What was your day like at Scarborough? What time did you have to get up in the morning? About six o'clock. How were you awakened? By the drill sergeant who came in and yelled out, wakey, wakey, rise and shine. What, uh, what were you staying in? Did you, was, was your, what was your room like? I was in the basement of this old hotel with a bunch of guys. Do you remember about how many were in that basement with you? There were about six of us. Okay. And he would get, get you up and then would you have breakfast? Then we had breakfast, yeah. Yeah. And uh, in another room in the hotel. Uh-huh. And then, then we would go out on parade. Okay. And what, what were those two weeks like in general? What did they do during those couple of weeks? Well, we, we were in Scarborough more than two weeks. More than two weeks. How long? I honestly don't, don't remember. Don't know? What did they do? What was it like? This is basic training? Yeah. In, intense drill, marching up and down, and uh, physical inspections. Uh, we had to wear white belts, and uh, we had a white flash in our cap to denote we were volunteers for air crew. And uh, we were attended lectures on uh, Air Force drill and discipline and um, what was expected of us mm -hmm. and um, then we, we from there we went to Heaton Park in Manchester. What's at Heaton Park? H-E-A-T-O-N, Heaton Park. Mm -hmm. It's a big, wide open area, uh, mm -hmm. like a public park, and um, we were in a tent there. Now, Ma Manchester probably has more rain than any other city in the country, and uh, we were in these tents, and there was a split trench, we called them, beside the tent. And you were supposed to dive in there in, in the event of an air raid. And um, you also had to carry a gas mask and tin hat with you everywhere you went. Mm -hmm. And um, why were you sent to Heaton Park in Manchester? God knows. Did you go with everyone that was in your training? Yeah. How'd you get there? Do you remember? Train. Train. And you're staying in tents. And this is this is still in the early 1940, would you say? Yeah. Winter time? How long how long would you be then at, at uh, Heaton Park? I don't know. We, we were just sent there and um, it was bitterly cold and wet. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big puzzle was what do you do with a tin hat when it rains and there's an air raid on? Where, where do you where, where do you wear, wear your tin hat? Do you, you put it on your head? Or what's the most important part of your body to protect? Most of us put our tin hats over our crotch. 
I wondered if you were going that way. So, <laughs> how about how about uh, what were you doing during your time at Heaton Park? We had the usual drills and lectures. Mm -hmm. You would say you were there. You're not certain how long you were there. Were many weeks? Maybe three weeks. Three? Yeah. How about after Heaton Park? Then where? Um, well, we found out we were probably going to be shipped overseas. The way, way we found out that was uh, the, the local dance hall that we used to frequent Saturday nights. And the girls there always knew what was going to happen to us. You weren't told by your superiors what was going to happen no, to you? No, no, Now, how do you think they knew? No idea. <laughs> but you would find out from, from the gals there, and they, they knew that you were going to be shipped. Did they know where you were going to be shipped overseas? It was either Canada or the United States. What, uh... What happened next? Well, the next thing that happened was we were shipped out by train and um, went to Gurok. Spell that. G-O-U-R-O-C-K mm -hmm. in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And um, Prior to that, I, I had been dating a couple of gals who were from Canada. Uh, can't remember their names, and I haven't got the phone numbers either. But they were from Hamilton, Ontario. And they said, if you ever get out to Canada, you, you know, look up this name, and they gave me the name of another girl, and they said, she'll take care of you. When you're in Gurak in, in Scotland, where it was, what happened next? Well, the next thing that happened, we boarded a, a, a huge ocean liner. Mm -hmm. It was the Queen Mary. Boarded the Queen Mary. I'm going to hold off. Just a second. Now you said you boarded the Queen Mary. How, ma um, how many were on board the ship? Do you remember how many? How when I crossed over, there were about 5,000. 5,000. And so, um, where, where were your sleeping assignments on the Queen Mary? In a regular cabin. They had built bunks that uh, went, went right up to the ceiling. And um, I would guess there were six of us jammed in there to a cabin. This would be a cabin for two people. How long did it take for you to, to, to uh, travel across the Atlantic? Well, ho hold on a minute. Um, we st sailed one night. Okay. And. Uh, I remember getting up the next day and um, we, we could tell the ship was moving and uh, it's a weird chance to sail at night and then wake up and realize you are at sea. And so we had to go down to the main dining room for breakfast. And I remember, it's the only time I've felt close to seasickness. I've never been seasick or airsick in my life. But I remember walking down the main stairway. There's a beautiful, great, ornate stairway to the dining room. And uh, as I put my feet down, the, the steps seemed to go away from me. 
was a bit, a bit really weird sensation. Anyhow, I got down to the dining room and um, we had an incredible breakfast of bacon and eggs. Now, I, we'd had full rationing in England. I hadn't seen an egg or, hmm. since the war started. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember how many helpings of bacon and eggs I had, but the, the crew of the liner treated us pretty well. I had about three enormous plates of bacon and eggs. And um, then, then I was assigned to a work mm -hmm. camp. And our job was every morning they would take us down into the bowels of the ship and we had to load trolley cars up with uh, barrels of Rupert's Ale. Had Rupert's Ale New York on them. Mm -hmm. And we'd take these to the various bars around the ship and distribute so many barrels to each bar. And uh, that was an interesting job. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we used to get given. I don't know whether they give us a barrel of ale or what. But I remember we always had lots of booze in our cabin because we could take a tin mug and lean out of our bunk bed and scoop it up full of beer and uh, so that made the job worthwhile. Do you remember how many days the trip took to get over? I don't exactly because we zigzagged. That's my next question. You had a zigzag? Yeah. We, we had, we had an, uh, an escort, a, a cruiser to escort us, but she couldn't keep up with us. And uh, so pretty well on our own after the first day. And um, I, I remember it was fa fairly rough the first few days at sea. But uh, w one morning when we, we must have gotten fairly, fairly close to New York, I, I was up on the deck and it was incredibly calm. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. sea was just like glass. You, you wouldn't believe that how calm the Atlantic could be. And um, You came into New York City? Hmm? Where did you come in? Where did you arrive at? Well, we didn't know where we were going to arrive at. Okay. But I remember being up on the deck one morning and I realized we were going to land in New York City because I could see the city and then I could see the Statue of Liberty and I remember the words on the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. I forget how they start out. came in and saw the Statue of Liberty and came up the Hudson River. And docked to Pier 90. Pier 90? That was the Cunard dock. Pier 90. The, uh, the, uh, you had talked about, uh, was that your first time to New York City? What happened when you arrived at, uh, at the Cunard dock at, at the well, pier? Um, I, I remember two things. We were docked by a couple of tugs, and um, I remember looking down at the water, full of contraceptives. 
<laughs> so I thought, well, it's a good start. Life in New York, and uh, and then, then R Riverside Drive went past there, and there were hundreds of cars going by, all honking their to horns and flashing their lights, and people waving at us. We, we were heroes, you know. They'd been reading in the newspaper about how London had been bombed. <coughs> The headline was London can take it, and uh, it, it was funny to feel like a hero that hadn't done anything. And uh, they wouldn't let us go ashore. <laughs> they knew that they would get us back. <laughs> And uh, that night we were put on a, uh, one of those uh, ships they had, they... Ferry. Uh, ferry. Uh, it was a ferry boat, it was like a ferry boat, and it took us across the river and we were, we landed up in uh, Pennsylvania Station. I don't know how the hell we got there. Okay. But we weren't allowed near the civilian population. Why? Do you know why? Sure. We, we'd have escaped. You, you'd never have come back. <laughs> when they put you at, at Pennsylvania Station, where you boarded a train, I'm assuming, where did you go? Okay. We boarded the train and we um, made this time we, we had a pretty good idea we were going to be in Canada. And um, we went up through New England and um, uh, We stopped at this station in New England, I don't know which one it was, and uh, a whole crowd of um, American, I think they were with American Express agents came on board, they had their uniforms on, and asked us if we'd like to send a, a wire home to our folks back in England and we said sure but we haven't got any money <laughs> they said don't worry about that we'll take care of that so they gave us each a pad and we wrote, wrote down hi I'm in the United States and going up to Canada love Charles and um, that was a nice experience um, How long did the train ride take to, uh, from Pennsylvania Station to Canada? Do you remember? I don't remember because we went up to Moncton, New Brunswick. I imagine we were, we were it would be at least a, a one hour, I don't know, maybe two days. Was it all British? RAF on that train? Yeah. And you were all heading to the same destination? Yeah. And so, the, the, uh, the, 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 the end of the line was New Brunswick? Moncton. Moncton, okay, Moncton, all right, got it. And what happened when you got to Moncton? We, we were... It's M-O-N-C-T-O-N. Mm -hmm. We were marched to this camp, and uh, it was a huge camp, it had rows and rows of wooden huts, two two-story wooden huts, and uh, mm -hmm. we were assigned to a hut, and uh, 
Well, we were there we had more drill every day and lectures. The usual service, BS, uh, BS. Drill and lectures. What time of year was it that you were at, at uh, Moncton? Do you remember? M must have been in the spring, I would think. 1940? Um, and and how long how long were you at Moncton? How long were you at that camp? Two or three weeks. And you it sounds like you went through a lot of drill and lectures. Okay. And uh, what were the lectures on? The Air Force discipline. Mm -hmm. That type of thing. KR and ACI, King's Regulations and Air Council Instructions. What happened at the end of those those weeks at Moncton? Where What happened next? Okay, then I, then I was, a group of us were put on a train. Okay. <clears throat> and remember, all the trains were steam. It looked enormous compared with the small trains in England. And we set off across Canada to Prince Albert in Saskatchewan. That took about five days. Did you stay on that train the whole time? Yeah. Did you sleep on that train? Yeah. What was uh, what was the train like? Was it? Did you stay it? Did you have rooms? We're we're in, in uh, I found out later these were trains that the Canadian Railway had used to haul immigrants across the country. People who'd emigrated in the thirties, twenties, and thirties. I had an upper bunk, no sheets or anything. I had a pillow and I used to just sleep in my uniform. Stayed on the train the whole time? Whole time. You got you there. What was, what's at Prince Albert? Prince Albert is the northernmost city in Canada. And what do they have there? Is it a camp? Is it a airfield? They had an airfield. An there, airfield. Yeah. All right, airfield at Prince Albert, and this is probably the late spring, nineteen forty, that you arrived there. Uh, early spring, maybe. Okay. And how long would your assignment be at Prince Albert? Do you remember? I don't know. I think we think we were there for about three months. About three months. Okay. Now, what what happens when you arrive at Prince Albert? Where where do you go? Where do they where do they put you in? Where do they where do you stay? Well, they they've got these two story wooden huts, mm -hmm. and we, we were assigned to a uh, hut, mm -hmm. and um, the school was run by was run by a bunch of civilians. It was a civilian school. But the RAF had their disciplinary people on board. They had you know, f flight sergeants and mm -hmm. who could yell at us and give us orders. But all of the flying instructors were civilians. Would this be your first time up in a plane? No, I I did go up in England what, what, before I went to Eaton Park. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, oh, we were, I was up at Carlisle in Scotland. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention that. And you had flown a little bit there? Had Yeah, I, I flew for about 10 hours there. Mm -hmm. In Carlisle, Scotland. With, with an RAF instructor. What kind of plane did you fly in? Tiger Moth. Tiger Moth? And um, 
Was this after you had classroom instruction before you, they put you into the, the tiger moth to, to learn yeah. to fly? Yeah. And you were with an instructor in Carlisle, Scotland. Yeah. And and they took you up there, and and that was uh, your first experience at flight. Yeah. Did you did you get airsick at all? No, never never been airsick. Did you find that you liked it? I loved it. You loved doing it. Did you did you solo at all in those ten hours? Yeah. Yeah. They wanted to see how long it would take you to solo, and whether you had a natural aptitude for flying, because if you didn't, then they segregate you and you'd be sent to a school for radio operators or mm -hmm. air gunners, that type of thing. And that happened in Carlisle, Scotland, before you probably got, was that before you, uh, before you came, came over on the Queen Mary? So you were in yeah. Scotland and that was yeah. just before then. All right, we're, we're going to finish with this first tape and we'll pick up then with your continuing um, in Prince Albert in Saskatchewan.